Broadway Church Online. My name is Tyrone, and you have joined us for our new six-week sermon series, Legendary Lives, Life-Changing Lessons. Together, we'll explore pivotal events in the lives of some of the Bible's most legendary figures. Pastor Darren will be sharing a message from God's Word a little later, but before we continue, I would love for you to share this video as it really does help spread what God is doing here at Broadway Church. And if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, we encourage you to do this now and you'll always be in the loop with all that's going on here at Broadway. If you happen to miss last week's message, Pastor Simon wrapped up our series called Really Stupid Proverbs with Do Whatever Makes You Happy, where he examined some of the most common proverbial wisdom of our age and how it measured up to the Bible. Check out this clip. God is less concerned with your happiness and more concerned with your holiness. God's less concerned with our happiness. He's more concerned with our holiness. So does God want you to be happy? Absolutely he does. And he knows the only way to experience true happiness is by getting holy, getting your life in alignment with his design, with the way he ordered the world to work. God first, others second, you third. You see, God's less concerned with our happiness. He's more concerned with our holiness. If you want to hear the full message, you can go to our website where we have the entire sermon available for you. In just a few moments, the worship team is going to come and lead us in a time of worship. But before that happens, why don't you check out some of the things that are coming up here at Broadway? Hey Broadway, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Nathan and I am the Young Adults Pastor here at the Broadway Vancouver campus. We have a ton of stuff happening here at Broadway for you and your family, so why don't you check these things out? Are you looking to get connected here at Broadway Church? Well, we have a small group for you. I want to encourage you to check out our small group page and get plugged in. We have home groups, online groups, and as well as groups that meet at our campuses. Not only that, but we also have an open small group called Midweek Talks, where you can drop in anytime, and we have one in Vancouver, Port Coquitlam, and Surrey. You should join a group today. We have a Parents with Preschoolers Stay in Play group happening at both our Vancouver and Port Coquitlam campuses on Thursday mornings. In Poco, it happens from 10 to 11 a.m. and in Vancouver, it happens from 10 a.m. to noon. You're invited. Now, if you are in high school, we have amazing youth services happening every week just for you. If you live in the Vancouver area, we meet every Friday night at 7 p.m. at the City Reach Warehouse building. If you're in Surrey or Poco, we meet every Friday night at 7 p.m. at our Poco campus. You are invited. Would you like to make a difference in the life of someone experiencing homelessness or other challenges in our city? The City Reach Club Freedom Team currently has openings on Sunday evenings at our Surrey and Coquitlam locations for our food service and guest interaction teams. We believe every person was designed to experience and express the purest love imaginable. And Club Freedom is a great place to put that into practice. You can sign up on the City Reach website. Our annual Singing Christmas Tree performances this year will be December 6th to 8th and then December 13th to 15th. The second batch of tickets will be released November 6th at noon on our Singing Christmas Tree website at VancouverSCT.com. We would love for you to take this opportunity to invite someone who needs to hear the gospel message. If you missed anything that I said, you can visit our website at broadwaychurch.com for more information on our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Now, it's almost time for us to worship, but first, I want to read you a short passage to prepare our hearts for what God wants to do in this moment. Psalm 145 verse 3, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. As we gather here today, let Psalm 145 verse 3 remind us that we are in the presence of a God whose greatness cannot be measured, whose majesty goes beyond our understanding. He is truly worthy of all of our praise. He has shown us grace upon grace, mercies that never fail, and a love that surpasses all. Today, 
Let's recognize that we worship a God who reigns over all creation, who is sovereign in every season, and who cares for us intimately. So as we come together in this time of worship, let us stand in awe of his greatness. Let our songs be filled with wonder and let our hearts overflow with gratitude for the mighty God we serve. Proudly family, welcome to church. Let's all stand this time to praise Jesus for who he is and what he's done for us. So let's sing together, come on. Hey, 
You deserve the praise. 
He's the name above all other names. In our life, he is the name above all other names. I get myself in trouble when I put something else on the top shelf instead of him. I get out of balance, I get out of sync. When I put my worries as the name above all names. Where I put my abilities to fix it as the name above all names. Jesus is the name above all names. More than your sickness, more than your pain, more than what you don't have or what you do have. Jesus is the name above all names. There's nothing else. There is nothing else for your sickness. There is nothing else for your pain, the pain that's in your heart. There is nothing else for your lack of purpose that you seek, you find in your life. There is nothing else that can satisfy. There is nothing else that you need to look at except Jesus. He is the name above all names. God, today we give you praise because your name is higher than any other. It is to you that we pray. It is you that we long for. It is your presence that we need in our life. It is your presence that we need in our every single day. God, as we leave the, our house to go to work, as we leave to go to school, whatever it is, we need your presence as we raise our children. We need you to be the name above all names. I don't need another book. I don't need another strategy. I don't need another dollar. I don't need another pill. I need Jesus. Jesus is the name above all names. And God, today, we believe that. We reach out to you. And God, we say, we remind ourselves when we are tempted to put something else on the top shelf, you are the name above all names. I don't need anything else. I need to seek you. I need to look to you. I need to see what your word says. I need to see what your life did. Thank you, God, that you are our example nothing else will do and we need nothing else we lift you high and we give you praise and it is in your name that we pray and everybody said amen amen welcome to broadway church thank you worship team for leading us in worship today if you're new to broadway church we would love for you to fill out our digital in touch card just scan the qr code on the screen and fill out the form a pastor will get back to you and help you find answers to your questions about growing in your faith or connecting at broadway now we are going to transition into our time of giving if you are new to broadway church please feel under no obligation to give you do not have to pay to watch or attend church however if you would like to financially support what god is doing here at broadway we would love for you to do that now our preferred way of giving is for you to go to the Give tab on our website and check out the online banking giving option. We accept your credit card over the phone if you call the church office. You can also come in in person from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. during the week if you want to drop it off. You can also use text to give If you text the word GIVE to the number on the screen, it'll walk you through the prompts to get you set up. Or you can mail checks to the church. Now, as I mentioned before, Pastor Darren will be sharing a message with us in just a moment. But first, why don't you take a moment to subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with what's happening here at Broadway Church. And you still have time to share this video as it really does help us reach many more people and share the good news of Jesus. Now, we'd like to show you a video featuring Boxes of Love, an annual event that spreads Christmas joy to vulnerable families in Greater Vancouver. Let's watch this together. Thank you again for joining us today. Getting in the Christmas mood Changing lives with gifts and food Buy a box of love, change a life today Just a simple plan Buy a box to help your fellow man Then the love of Christmas goes on and on and on and on As our Boxes of Love campaign grows each year, we're reaching out to you, our community, to share in the true spirit of giving. We need your help. 
With your donation, we can provide families in need in Vancouver, Surrey, and the Tri-Cities with more than just gifts. Each box of love includes new toys, grocery gift cards, stuffies, and special presents. But that's not all. Your generosity will also provide each family with fresh food support through our Food for Families program and give families the chance to participate in a family, festive, full of joy event full of the true meaning of Christmas. For a donation of just $200, you can sponsor a family in need. However, no donation is too small. All donations in any amount will make a huge difference towards this cause. This year, we've increased the total number of families that we can serve to 800 families. That's 3,000 kids. So we need your help. We're also looking for volunteers to make this event a success in all three locations. So to donate or to sign up as a volunteer, visit us at cityreach.org slash boxes of love. $200 is the cost of a box of love, a Christmas you will never forget. friends in need we can change a family's life today thank you for your generosity as we aim to support 800 vulnerable families in our community we wish you a very merry christmas filled with love peace and joy don't stop the giving Hold on to that feeling It's lies that you're changing Don't stop the giving Hold on to that feeling It's lies that you're changing Every so often in life, we find ourselves in a moment of crisis, a moment when our entire worldview is challenged, a moment when everything we believe is thrown into turmoil, a moment when our strongest and most important pillars are being shaken. Now, as followers of Jesus, we have a stabilizing anchor in such moments. At the foundation of our lives, at the very core of our being, dwells the eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God. So even when everything around us is in chaos, we can know that the one within us stands strong. But what do you do when the source of your chaos is not the world around you, but the one within you? What do you do when the God at the center of your life doesn't seem to be making sense? Have you ever been standing in the middle of a worship service, surrounded by other Christ followers, singing along with the words up on the screen, when all of a sudden you feel a knot in your stomach and your voice goes silent? What's the problem? Well, the problem is this. You're experiencing the tension that occurs when what is clearly projected on the screen is not honestly reflected in your heart. Let me give you an example. A song often sung in churches nowadays is entitled, King of My Heart. It's a great song. The lyrics go like this. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Well, so far you're fine. I mean, the words on the screen reflect the aspirations in your heart. It's when the song builds to the crescendo where the words begin to get stuck in your throat. You're never going to let, never going to let, never going to let me down. 
You're never going to let, you're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. When you sing that, if you sing that, there's a hesitation in your heart. Because at that moment, deep within you, you are struggling. Have you ever found yourself hearing those words, singing those words, and deep within you, you're thinking to yourself, sometimes I wonder what you're doing up there, God. Sometimes what I ask you to do, what I expect you to do, does not at all fit with what you are actually doing. Have you ever found yourself thinking, God, sometimes I do feel like you've let me down. What should we do in such moments? What should we do when life doesn't seem to be making sense? What should we do when God doesn't seem to be making sense? That's what we're going to investigate today. And we're going to do that by studying an event in the life of one of the most legendary figures in the Bible, the man named Abraham. The man that God himself handpicked to be the father of the nation of Israel, to be the genealogical source of Jesus, the Messiah. In the Old Testament portion of the Bible, you won't find anyone more legendary than Abraham. And we're going to discover today that Abraham had a crisis moment in his life, a crisis at a level that I dare say none of us have ever faced or will ever face. A crisis that had to have caused Abraham to question everything, including God himself. And how Abraham responded to that crisis will serve as a life-changing lesson and example for all of us. Now, to fully appreciate the impact of Abraham's crisis, we need to take a moment to understand the background of Abraham's life. Now, we first meet this man in the first verse of the 12th chapter of the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis. The author of Genesis describes the moment when God, seemingly out of nowhere, handpicks a man who was then named Abram, not Abraham, but Abram, to be head of a brand new nation. Let's read it together. The author of Genesis wrote, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now, this took place in a patriarchal culture, meaning a culture where men dominated. And not just any men, but the eldest man in each family. The oldest man in the family was the patriarch. They were like the king. Each family was like a nation. And the eldest man in that family was the king of that nation. And it appears that Abraham was next in line. His father, Terah, was still living, but Abraham appears to be next in line. So when he was being asked, being told to leave his family, his father's household and his father's land, he was being told to leave everything behind that he had ever known. His whole inheritance Forget about it. See, God called Abram to stop trusting in his family background and his family inheritance for his future and to start trusting in God himself for his future. And to that end, God made Abram a promise. God promised Abram that he would make a great nation out of his biological descendants. I will make you into a great nation, God said. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, this all sounded wonderful, except I'm certain that Abe and his wife were wondering how God was going to do this. Because even though the name Abram meant exalted father, when God spoke those words, Abram was 75 years old and had zero children. When God made that promise, Abram had zero biological descendants. But God made Abram a promise, and Abram chose to believe God and to believe that promise. So that's what Abram did for the next 10 years. Now, for the next decade, Abram and his wife Sarai did a lot of believing, but zero conceiving. And as time went on, they began to grow frustrated and confused. 
So one day, God appeared to Abram in a vision to encourage him. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? That was the, con- the culture back then. If you didn't have children, the, the eldest servant in your home was your inheritance. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then God took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Once again, God promised a biological son would be given. Once again, Abram was encouraged by that promise. He continued to trust God and to believe that promise. However, there were still no children on the horizon. So Abram's wife had an idea. Now, Sarai made the assumption that she was the problem. So she suggested a workaround solution. Sarai proposed that they take advantage of a legal loophole that existed in the culture at that time. Sarai suggested that Abram sleep with Sarai's servant, a woman named Hagar, and the child born from that union would be adopted as their child. Technically, that child would be a biological descendant of Abram. Now, I don't know how much convincing it took for Abram, but that's exactly what he did. And a boy named Ishmael was eventually born. It was Abram's hope that Ishmael would be acceptable to God as the means of fulfilling God's promise. God, however, remained silent on the matter. And 13 more years pass. And during those 13 years, Abram and Sarai grew 13 years older, and together they still had not produced a child. And then suddenly, God appears to Abram once again. We read about it in chapter 17 of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant, my contract between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and, uh, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, exalted father. Your name will be Abraham, meaning the father of many. For I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. Okay, I'm changing your name from exalted father to father of many. Oh, sounds great, God. But God had more to say. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Sarai means my princess. Sort of like a pet name a father might give to his daughter. Her name will be Sarah, which simply means princess. The the name, the regal name, uh, title, I should say, that someone would have for a, a royal figure. He says, you're no longer call her my princess, call her princess. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Keep reading what happens next. Abram fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, But your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He'll be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac." whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. Well, as you keep reading in the story, a year later, Isaac, the miracle child, is finally born. Can you imagine the excitement? 
This was the child that had been promised. This was the miracle boy through whom a nation would be born and the entire world would be blessed. Everything that God had ever promised to Abraham was wrapped up in that child. Everything that Abraham had ever hoped for and prayed for and dreamed about was embodied in that promised child, Isaac. And then it happened. Is there a day of infamy that stands out in your life? A tragic day, a terrible day. It's a moment that you can still remember where you were and what you were doing when you received the news. In fact, it's so painful, I'm sorry I've even stirred its memory within you. It's the day when everything changed in your life. When you woke up that morning, all was well. Life was unfolding as planned. But when you placed your head on your pillow that evening... The world had become a radically different place. Your life was in chaos, and you were wondering where God was. Abraham had just such a moment. Abraham had just such a day. Now, we don't know how old Isaac was when Abraham's crisis arose. The Bible simply refers to Isaac as a boy. The Hebrew term can mean anything from an infant to an adult. What we do know is that Isaac was old enough to talk, to reason, to travel with his father, and to carry a heavy load of weight on his back. So it would be safe to assume that on the day of Abraham's crisis, Isaac was at the very least 10 years old, at the least. Well, with that in mind, read the words recorded in Genesis 22, the words that rocked Abraham's world. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Can you even fathom what it would have been like to hear those words? Can you imagine what Abraham must have been feeling and thinking? I mean, what kind of thoughts would have been rushing through his mind? In what world, in what universe does this make any sense? Why would God require such a thing? What kind of a God would call for such a thing? Now, today, we don't have the time to delve into the ethical or apologetic issues that this passage raises, but you should know that I will be taking the time to face and address those questions in an upcoming Bible class entitled, The Most Difficult Passages in the Bible. Today, let's just deal with the story as it's presented in Genesis. God promised a son to Abraham and Sarah. God waited until it was physically impossible for them to have a son before God finally and miraculously provided that promised son. Now, God's calling Abraham to sacrifice that promised son. God tells Abraham to kill the child through whom the promise was to be fulfilled. God tells Abraham to kill the child through whom the promise was to be fulfilled. Madness, sheer madness. So what does Abraham do? How does Abraham respond? And what can we learn from it all? Well, the author of Genesis describes Abraham's response in very clear terms. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We'll worship and then we'll come back to you. Now, it took three days for Abraham to reach the place that God had chosen. By the way, that place is known to this day. It's where the Jewish temple would later be built. Today, the Dome of the Rock covers that place in the city of Jerusalem. As Abraham walked for three days, he wrestled with his thoughts. The author of the New Testament book, known as Hebrews, tells us the content and the conclusion of Abraham's mental wrestling. Read it with me from Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only, 
even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned. But Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. The biblical writer gives us a glimpse into the mind of Abraham during his three-day journey. Now, in your Bible or on your outline, underline the words, Abraham reasoned. During that agonizing three-day journey, Abraham remembered and Abraham reasoned. Abraham remembered the promise of God, reasoned regarding the nature of God, and then responded in obedience to God. Abraham remembered the promise of God, he reasoned regarding the nature of God, and then responded in obedience to God. After years of serving God, after years of following God, after days of pondering God, Abraham decided to trust God. Abraham reasoned and Abraham decided that God could be trusted. How does a person express trust? How can we show that we trust someone? Well, trust is expressed through obedience, is one way. When we trust someone, we are willing to obey them. And at that moment in time, the only way that Abraham could express his trust in God was by sacrificing Isaac. And after three long days of remembering and reasoning, Abraham decided he would do that, with the full expectation that afterwards somehow God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. Because Abraham reasoned that God had made a promise, that through Isaac a nation would be born, and Abraham knew that God keeps his promises. So Abraham decided to trust God in the middle of all this confusion. I mean, read again Abraham's words from Genesis 22, and you'll see this dynamic. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We, I and the boy, will worship, and then we, I and the boy, will come back to you. See, underline that word, we. Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We'll worship, we'll come back to you. Now, Abraham wasn't certain how God was going to do things in the midst of this crisis, but Abraham was certain that God could be trusted in the midst of this crisis. Genesis 22 tells us what happened next. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, The fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When you keep reading the story, as Abraham is about to plunge the knife into his son, God calls out to him from heaven and stops it, declaring that Abraham has passed the test of trust and obedience that was required of the father of an entire nation. At his moment of crisis, Abraham set his fears aside and brought his faith to the forefront. What do we do when we're tempted to feel like God is letting us down? What should we do when life doesn't seem to be making sense? What should we do when God doesn't seem to be making sense? What can we learn from Abraham's legendary life? Well, that brings us to today's big idea. Here it is. Bringing your trust in God to the foreground moves your fear of the circumstances to the background. Bringing your trust in God to the foreground moves your fear of the circumstances to the background. So what's going on in your life today? What circumstances are dominating your heart and your mind right now? Perhaps as you're listening to me, you feel cornered, you feel caged, you feel confused. At this present moment in time, God's not acting like you expected him to act. At this present moment in time, God's not doing what you think he should be doing. And you're tempted to give in to fear and to give up on God. Follow the example of Abraham at his moment of crisis. Bringing your trust in God to the foreground moves your fear of the circumstances to the background. Like Abraham, reason it through. Trust that God knows what you do not know. Trust that God sees what you do not see. Trust that God can do what you could never do. When the circumstances around you are threatening, trust the God within you to bring you through. 
Let me leave you with a scenario that I've often find myself returning to in moments of crisis in my life. It's a scenario that I have mentioned before because it's a scenario that I often picture when the world around me is not making sense. I picture myself as a disciple at the foot of the cross. Now, if you were a disciple at the foot of the cross watching Jesus being crucified, what would you be thinking to yourself? I don't know about you, but here's what I'd be thinking. I'd be thinking, God, if you even exist, and I'm not sure if you do exist right now, what I do know is this. From what I'm seeing, God, you are not a God of love because a God of love would not be letting this happen. I followed this man for three years. He did nothing but, but praise you. He did nothing but lead people to you. He did nothing but heal people, encourage people, feed people, love people. And this is what you give to him in response to all of that? God, if you exist, you are not a God of love. This is exhibit A. This man hanging on this cross is exhibit A, that you are not a God of love. That's what I'd be thinking if I was a disciple at the foot of the cross. But what does the Bible say? Scripture says that God demonstrates his love to us in this. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, the moment we're holding up as exhibit A, that God cannot be a God of love, is the moment God is pointing to his exhibit A, that no, this is the moment I am loving you. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The very moment we think is proof that God's not loving is the very moment when God is demonstrating his love for us. If you feel cornered, if you feel caged, if you feel confused by the circumstances in your life, follow the example of Abraham. Bring your trust in God to the foreground and move your fear of the circumstances to the background. Let's pray together. God, we all bring to you the chaos in our lives, the confusion in our lives, the struggles that we have. We're all tempted at moments in our lives to wonder where you are, to wonder what you're doing, to doubt. And we confess right now that there are times when we feel anger towards you, frustration about you. But right now, we make a decision. We remember all that you've done for us and we reason that you are a God who can be trusted. So right now, we bring our trust to the foreground and we move our fear of the circumstances to the background. God, we declare that we trust you. In fact, say that with me in your prayer right now. God, I trust you. I don't understand you. I don't understand what's going on, but I trust you. I trust that you know what I don't know, that you can do what I could never do. I trust you. Maybe you're watching me right now and you've never trusted him for the most important thing in your life, the forgiveness of your sin. Right now, I want to give you an opportunity to do that, to give him your entire life. Pray this prayer with me. God, I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to cleanse me of my sin, of my past, my rebellion. Fill me with your spirit. I give you control of my life. Change me and transform me by the power of the resurrected Jesus. Fill me with the Spirit of God to give me a new power, new thoughts, new desires from this moment forward. Now, I know I'm not gonna be perfect, but as I daily walk with you and acknowledge my sin before you as I, as I fall moment by moment, I know you will cleanse me and you will justify me and you will strengthen me day by day, moment by moment, as you transform me into your image, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. I give you my life. Begin to change me from this moment on. In the name of the resurrected Jesus, I pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, congratulations, you are now a follower of Jesus. If you'd like to, I recommend that you email the address on your screen right now and one of our pastoral team will email you back just to help you take any next steps. Now, don't worry, you're not joining Broadway Church. We're not gonna put you on a mailing list. We're not tricking you. We'll simply offer our services to you in any way that we can if we can help you in any way take the next step. At the very least, I would recommend you tell somebody about this decision you made. Someone that you know to be a Christ follower, someone that you that recommended to you that you go to church or maybe brought you to church, tell them about the decision that you've made today. 
Well, thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll be with us next time as we continue on this new series, Legendary Lives, Life-Changing Lessons. Thank you for joining us at Church Online this week. If you have any prayer needs or requests, or if you're new to Broadway and you're looking to connect deeper, scan the QR code on the screen and a pastor will reply to you and help you get connected. We want you to keep growing as you learn more about Jesus. Lastly, don't forget to check out broadwaychurch.com for all the things going on at the church and have a great week.